I think many of us are taken back because our patients expect us to have detailed information on nutrition, but how many of you had detailed education in medical school or dental school or anything else? Anybody? No, hardly anyone. So we have to bridge that gap, and I'm hoping I can fill in some of that information for you today and bring us up to date. I had a four-hour elective that had mostly to do with um, third world nutrition things, but fortunately I think all of us are getting more savvy in this regard. So I'm going to look at macronutrient issues. Um, I want to talk a little bit about glycemic load rather than focusing on glycemic index. I mean, then I clearly want to look at the top eight nutrition deficiencies we see in America today because those are having a very adverse effect on health and there's things we can easily correct to make a huge difference. And I'll go through some list of what you can get from food and supplements, and I, I think our patients expect us to be experts on this topic, and so hopefully we'll achieve those goals. I have several hundred references related to this talk, so if anyone would like additional information, please email me. I, we don't, I really don't, I, I'm unable to space-wise to include all those references here for you today. So macronutrients get the most publicity. I, don't, I can't say they're the most important, but they certainly get the most press because people write books about them and then they're on TV shows. So, you know, that protein, high fat, low fat, high carb, low carb, uh, it's a big book industry. Uh, and the generic recommendations we give are sometimes challenging. You know, I, I think one of the best studies that looked for weight loss using these um, was out of Stanford where they used an Atkins diet, an Ornish diet, a Mediterranean diet, and they compared them. And of interest, um, they all were about equally effective when people were randomized to different diets for weight loss. The big problem was most people couldn't stick on the harder to follow diets for more than four to six months. And the Mediterranean by far had the best adherence and had similar weight loss to the others. So that was really interesting. Um, but I think what we're going to find is if we could look at people's genetics, we could better predict which one they should have been on to start with um, for better outcomes. So when they actually did, they looked at blood work before that study and people were randomized, and they found if someone had a low-fat gene, pref low gene preference and they were on a low-fat diet, they lost 14 pounds, whereas someone during that same period was unmatched to another diet, they only lost three. If they were on a, had a low-carb gene preference and they were on a low-carb diet, they lost 12.3 pounds compared to 2.2 if they were on a different diet. So there may be some tremendous benefit in matching our genetic needs before we make a recommendation. I think we're moving towards that. There's, there, there's several gene pairs out there we can look at, FTO, APO, PPAR genes that have to that look and ex the expression of how we respond to different macronutrient combinations. Um, so this is going to be very interesting in the future, just so we will actually say we'll do a test and based upon that come up with better nutrition recommendations. Um, the Mediterranean diet study that they had in Spain, they did a segment, a small segment of that for looking at uh, gene pairs and there were certain pairs that RS9939609 gene reflect if you had that you sh and you're on a Mediterranean diet, you're going to have better blood sugar control and better weight loss. So you, again, more predictive. They've done studies in Greece where they looked at, for a weight loss clinic, and looked at people's gene pairs before and they randomized them appropriately based on those and got much better results um, by doing that. So there's more studies coming out to support this kind of information. So I, I think it still needs some improvement. I think the, the testing we've got now on genes, in five years we're going to know a lot more about it on the tests that are being done today. And we'll be able to give even better recommendations. But it's definitely going to be the future um, for making recommendations regarding macronutrient um, issues. I think probably more important currently are some of the micronutrient issues I'm going to talk about in much more detail. I do want to talk about the glycemic controversy out there. And we've got all these books based on glycemic index. Uh, it's what the media talks about. Our patients have heard about it. And um, it's, you know, this is a research tool for glycemic index to measure how your blood sugar responds based on a standard 50 or 100 gram carbohydrate meal with a specific food. It was never really intention, intended to be used for someone who's going to be um, following a specific eating plan. Um, it's a research tool, but we've got diet books that are based on it. 
Um, what's interesting is, when you look at glycemic load, that's the portion we get from food. So uh, I think carrots are one of the best examples. If you had to have 50 grams of carrots, um, that's a, it's like a small bucket. It's like 10 big carrots um, to actually get that much to raise your blood sugar. But no one could eat that. I couldn't eat that many carrots. You know, it's just not humanly possible. So it's, but if you look at glycemic load, you'd realize in a serving of carrots, a typical consumed serving, the glycemic load is three. So yes, we should tell people to eat their carrots. And, when you, look, and you can look at this at your um, leisure in the handout. But it really, if, when you see something with flour, you immediately see a very high glycemic load. Um, fruit, most of the fruit and vegetables, potatoes are an exception. Um, most of them are actually pretty low, and we should be eating more fruit and vegetables. And we sh that recommendation based on glycemic index, I think we have to stop using. So if you're using glycemic tables, please pick the load tables and use those for your recommendations, because they'll have a much more realistic impact on glycemic control for your patients. Um, all right. I think the biggest difference, though, reflects not, again, those macronutrients, but the micronutrients that we have significant deficiencies for that, we, that are really a slam dunk opportunity for us in age management medicine to improve um, and correct them. So that's really what I want to I'm going to focus on these top eight, and I'll go into some detail on them as to how you could make a really big difference. I like looking at food. So I tend to give people vitality foods they can eat. Um, and in our, we, I've been doing dietary research regimens since 1991. Usually when I tell people what not they can't eat, what they can't have, that forbidden list, I can maybe in a clinical trial get a 20 to 30% dietary change. But we have published and shown if I give them a list of foods to add, they should eat more often and I give them recipes to go with them, I get more than a 70 to 80% change in dietary behavior. So it's much more effective, it's easier to do, and your patients will certainly like you better by telling them what they should add instead of what they can't have. And it's so much more effective. Um, fibers, I'm gonna put number one, we're gonna come back to that, so um, more fiber in our diet, that's vegetable, fruit, beans, nuts. Um, Greens, I think, are fantastic for their pigment and vitamin K, as we'll talk about. Lean, not mean protein. There's a lot of mean protein out there today that's hormone and pesticide enriched. Um, I'm really looking for lean, free range, um, grass fed sources of protein. So it should be clean, lean protein is great in contrast to um, fatty, hormone, pesticide enriched, which we really need to watch out for. Seafood, three servings a week. You'll, I'm going to talk about omega-3s. I think beans are fantastic for fiber, for vitamin K, for potassium. Um, many foods we really need, especially for our heart. Um, cruciferous vegetables are terrific. We should get a cup a day for all their detoxifying capacity. Berries, you should have a cup a day because they're so wonderful for your brain cells and your arteries, the endothelial lining. It's probably one of the best brain foods we've got along with the seafood. Um, nuts, every study we've ever looked at shows we should eat more nuts for that healthy fat and fiber content. So one to two handfuls every day has clear proven cardiovascular benefit. Dark chocolate every day, it lowers your blood pressure, it decreases LDL oxidation. So that's something you want, and you're not gonna look bad asking your patients to eat more chocolate, right? It's gonna go over pretty well.